She was the closest friend that I had. And then all of a sudden, I just stopped hearing from her. Well, this is the two year anniversary of the shooting of Finding Pukwe, which for me feels like probably 20 years ago. Um, but it's kind of an incredible journey that we just passed 6 million views on the film on the CBC YouTube page, which is pretty incredible. And so the CBC thought it would be valuable if we had a little reunion and we all came together and had a little discussion about this incredible project, which was probably the funnest film uh, that I've ever made. Um, and just talk about how it came together and um, and everything like this and just get some updates on where where the everything's at now. Jess and I met because I was her student. I was taking guitar lessons because I was working on a music film that required me to know a little bit about how to play guitar and a little bit more about music. And we met and became fast friends. And she told me this story about her friend that she had when she was a little girl in Japan. Um, and so uh, I set about trying to get this film made. Um, and I enlisted the help of my two dear friends, Edmund Stenson and Felicity Gestrebo, um, who were passionate about the story as much as I was. And then we were able to go back to Japan um, and, and film this incredible story. There was no record of her name. There was no social media accounts, no photos, nothing. In the back of my mind, I was always worried that something bad had happened to her. So I'm going back to Japan to see if I can try and find Fukue. So Jess, I'm curious to know from your perspective, what was this whole journey like? How would you uh, define it or talk about it in retrospect? It's pretty wild. And also, you know, I had looked on my own for Fukue years ago and I had come up short. I followed some of the leads that we also subsequently followed in the making of the film, but didn't have the resources or team behind me to make it possible. Um, so I had sort of closed that book as being, you know, the an unsolvable, um, you know, mystery of my past. And so when you came along and said that you thought you'd be able to find her, I, or help me find her, I, I didn't think that that was possible, but I was like, sure, whatever it takes. You, you wanted the cost is that you're going to film me and all of my array of expressions and experiences while that happens for the world to see. Well, I don't really care about that. As long as you can find my friend or f figure out what happened to my friend, I'll go with it. For the most part, everyone's really like nice and like excited and crying and loving this film and that I would share this experience with them, honestly. Um, in my experience anyway and and but then there's some other people i've i've learned you know like yeah i heard the other side so the, the, my first experience of public scrutiny on on a widespread level like that and uh but it's been it's been good because i you know i've now learned how to deal with those things i think it only took two weeks to sort of uh, get accustomed to uh haters so that was you know that's a valuable skill i think also there was a lot of what I heard from people who reached out to me was that um, on top of just, you know, being inspired to connect with people from their past um, or, you know, remember things or whatever it is, um, that there's a lack, there's an abundance of stories about love in a romantic sense and familial love also, like family connections in, in not just documentaries, but in films and television and all of that. But there's there's a lack of maybe especially documentaries about sort of friendship and that kind of love. And so people were saying that they're really happy to see a story of that kind of love. And uh, so that's neat. I hadn't thought of it from that perspective. Ed, what were some of the recollections as you remember of the challenges making the movie? You are fluent in Japanese. You were living in Japan at the time we made this. And so how would you describe some of the cultural challenges or some of the difficulties in um, making this film and essentially having to babysit um, a Westerner who knows very little about the Japanese culture? What was that like for you? <laughs> I mean, 
I have many stories that I guess would be very amusing in retrospect of your finding the best possible ways to wind me up during shooting, finding the most Western things to do. I think the, the biggest memory I have is of you playing guitar and singing very badly in the back of a back of a truck as we were in the middle of a shoot. A good memory in the sense that it was very funny, but I also remember just feeling, I think the most difficult thing when you live in Japan is becoming accustomed, as you say, to the cultural differences that can be quite sharp at times. And it was certainly a challenge from a purely linguistic perspective, because obviously there's conversational Japanese, the kind of conversations as for are having now that are re relatively low key. And Jess knows this very well from speaking Japanese too, is that when it comes to formality, there's a whole world of verbal changes and like linguistic difficulties that <clears throat> it's difficult to know unless you know the language. And obviously when you're making a film, we all know from having made films that politeness and formality and getting the best out of the people that we're working with either behind the screen or in front of the screen requires a level of tact and um, I guess linguistic prowess is difficult enough in a first language, let alone a second. So I'd say the biggest challenge for me was corresponding and working on building those scenes with you whilst we were shooting. And obviously, as we, as we all know, the scenes unfolded naturally and meant that we had to really respond to how the, where the day took us and where the characters took us with Jess. And that meant often having to talk to people and convince people of things in a way that in Japanese requires a very good command of formality. And I think that was, it was a fun challenge because the language is beautiful. I'm sure you probably agree, Jess, it's an amazing language mm -hmm. and it's so, it's an empowering language to speak, but it's definitely a big challenge. Being that I was in Japan as a child, I have child fluency in Japanese, then plus whatever I learned on tour in Japan as a musician and those things, which is more formal because I'm speaking with like interviewers and uh, venue owners and that kind of thing. And even though I did have, um, friends there uh, I didn't have the I never like lived in Japan as an adult person and I didn't have time to develop the sort of colloquial like young adult sort of um, Japanese and so just watching Terrace House I watched a full season just in the background and I have like my Japanese has improved like I, I think my vocabulary has improved double and now I know how to speak like a normal person of my age. And so like, I wish I had watched before I went because, you know, the, it was fine. The message got across and we had you there and we also had um, Ryo and uh, who was the translator slash fixer. And, uh, and then I had, an, you know, more than enough to convey my, my message, but it, maybe it wasn't so eloquent. So I could have gained something from that. And that, but that's also, again, I think the positive side of having your Japanese be in some senses a lot of what you had when you were a kid is that that's what's so charming, right? Charming about you as a character and also charming about the story is that we're in some ways literally taking you back to childhood and taking you back to a language that you had at childhood. And I think even if audiences don't speak Japanese, they can feel that in the way that you're using the language you're interacting. And that's part of the the beauty of hearing you speak like that as you really feel like we're going back in time to something. Why do you think this film, Felicity, resonated the way it did? I think we were all pleasantly surprised and encouraged by its success. Um, why do you think people loved it as much as they did? Yeah, I think part of that really comes from just, uh, you know, in the film and, and just being so relatable and, and so genuine in, in um, wanting to to have that connection and i think everyone kind of feels that way about someone in their life but they don't necessarily um have a, you know a way to express it and i think because jess you are so open and enthusiastic i think that's kind of what the audience relates to you know you're almost like verbalizing um and and in actuality going on this journey doing something that they want to to do and and I think people really identify with that. Jess, I'm I'm curious to know how much contact you have with Fukue now. Are you sort of like pen pals again? How is she doing? Have you contacted her recently? Yeah. So we were in touch a lot at first, and then it was it became more like once a month. And you know, both of us are very busy, and we've done some like video chats with her and the kids, and um, 
Yeah, and so we mostly communicate by email, not by letters or anything like that. When it came out, I was actually like worried because no, none of us anticipated this much, um, you know, this virality <laughs> uh, of, of uh, you know, or interest or anything. And when we had talked to Fukue in Japan, she wants her anonymous life and her, her life, you know, her life to be unchanged. And that's, I thought that, that there would be no question that there would be no change to her life from the making of this film. And so I assured her of that. So when the film actually came out, I got really worried because I thought maybe Fukue thought that I knew this was going to be a big hit and would she think that I was trying to dupe her into doing something she wouldn't have otherwise been willing to do? And could it be that the, this film going viral will mean that my friendship will somehow be tainted with her because she will be questioned my motives. And so I was more concerned about that. I was like, at first I was like, oh, yay, it went viral, that's cool. And then I was like, oh no, like, could this have a bad impact on our relationship? But then it became clear that she was surprised. She knew I was surprised. She was honored that everyone was so into it. That's fantastic. That's, that, I think, is the best part of this conversation. I'm so glad Fukuoi is doing well, and um, I can't wait to return and have a tour of the house for myself. I'll be sure <laughs> to take my shoes off. Um, and I'm just Let's wondering... Make sure to bring the, the, the box of Japanese sweets that's the most expensive right. one offered, not the second most expensive one. <laughs> right. No, that, that's very important. Challenging for someone like me to go for the most <laughs> expensive one, but... Um, cultural lessons we learn along the way. Um, Ed, before we wrap up, I'm wondering if you have any um, memories. I know that you were closely monitoring the YouTube comments for a while. Do you remember <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> any stories um, that emerged? People leaving comments about, um, you know, friends that they wish they could reconnect with, anything like this? Yeah, good question. I mean, there's plenty of people who'd said I had a Japanese exchange student that I was very close to on their year abroad or I went to Japan and had a very ex similar experience to Jess. I can't speak to many specifics, but just to say that the overwhelming sense was that so many people had the experience. And as Felicity mentioned, so many people from so many places. This wasn't just localized to Canada. This was people in Serbia were sending us messages and commenting, talking about friends they had for a year. That is yeah, a, lovely, exactly, yeah. a lovely image. And before we wrap up, Jess, um, I, I know that there are a lot of fans of the film who I think now are fans of your music. So I'm wondering if you could give us an update about, you know, where you're at with the music, yeah. with, the, with the new album, what's going on there? Yeah, thanks for asking. Actually, you know, if anyone wants to see what's going on with me, I have uh, a YouTube channel with the handle Jessica Stewart Music, and I would love people to subscribe to that. I know a lot of people have subscribed to CBC Docs through this documentary, and I, I would love that some people also connect with me and see what I'm up to as well. And uh, yeah, so I'm working on this new pop album. It's actually basically done. I just pre-released the third single last Friday, and today we released the lyric video. It's a song called Crazy Love, and it's like a good dancing bop. So like right now, I don't know if anyone wants anything too serious. So. Um, it's a really fun song for the moment and uh, I'm really excited about the album and also yeah I put out like a month after um, the film came out people had expressed interest people kept asking about the song in the in the credits which thank you guys for allowing me to put my vocal in remember how I did that I had to fight for that one I was like I think you can let me put in the one with the vocal at the end and thank you for that because um, Fukui's theme part one is my most streamed and most sold and most listened to songs. So that's cool. Cause you, you know, like I, I did, there's a bunch of my stuff in that soundtrack and yeah. And that was like the pinnacle piece, which I actually wrote while we were filming B-roll. If you recall in your apartment, Ed, in, in Tokyo. You know, this is one of the amazing parts about having an incredible subject. Who's also a musician. Um, you know, Jessica, the music of the movie is incredible. I know that you work with, all of our friend uh, Matthew Chalmers on the score and together you guys did an incredible job, but I know that you really um, uh, steered that ship and, and I think that it was to the film's benefit. So, you know, well, that was really phenomenal. It, if it made people it cry, then, then something was right because even if something looks sad, you, it has to sound sad to, to cry over it. So I consider it a success. 
I think the other thing to say, Daniel, in terms of our experiences making the film is, and this goes for Jess too, we were, we were so lucky and I think thankful to be making the film in a rural part of Japan in which people were so welcoming and helpful to us in our day to day. The, the cafe that we shot in where that the husband and wife who'd owned the cafe for 30 or 40 years who yeah. happily let us film there and let us, yeah. you know, do and scenes they're in the movie to too. What's that? I think they're in the movie and B-roll maybe. Yeah, yeah, very, very, very briefly I remember. Here was a documentary that we had we didn't really know how it was going to turn out and lo and behold it becomes a story that that you could not have written a more I- ideal ending for and that doesn't happen very often and it's this you know really rare gift i think it was hitchcock who said that documentaries are really directed by god and <laughs> in so far as that you don't know how it's going to end and that was particularly evident in in this story and you know i'm grateful for for Ed, who, who really took the lead here in shaping the film, and Felicity for being patient and understanding um, with all of us, and most off to Jess for being probably the most compelling subject. I mean, the most incredible subject we could have ever hoped for. And the fact that this whole story came together as it, as it did was really, really special. And um, I'm just you know, filled with gratitude that so many people enjoyed it as much as they did. I just want to give a quick shout out to uh, like um, to my parents and my family because unfortunately their names were left off the credits of the film in error and they the footage that they provided the six VHS tapes that they had from the past I believe that without the um, visual of life in the past in Saku City that the story would have gotten lost and that people would not have been as like hooked as they were to find out what happened in, in the present day. And so I think that footage was huge. And I wanted to thank my parents for their help and, and, and for providing those tapes and also for their, their advisement because they talked with you too, Daniel and, yeah. and me. And I learned some things talking to them about their recollection of the experience, which kind of helped me learn more about myself. I really never thought that I would be in touch with Fukue again. I, I really thought like I had really sort of um, put it put it away um, after my last attempt, and I just didn't think it was possible. And I and I, I just thought it was going to be the unanswered mystery of my lifetime. And so um, there is an answer, and it was it was that Fukui is doing awesome, and um, and it's so amazing uh, to have connected, reconnected so incredibly together, like no weirdness or awkwardness, just immediately fast friends again. And um, I am incredibly thankful for that. So thank you, Daniel, for taking the reins and thank you, um, Felicity and Ed, for making the whole thing possible. Mm